forget to close your microphones. Also not talking with us. Why are you not talking with us? Okay. And I want to share a screen. You can um, talk, Galeta. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll read One minute. The... One minute. <clears throat> I will just remind you, meanwhile, Sarah is sharing her screen that, you know, if you have any questions or thoughts that you would like us to discuss, uh, you can uh, uh, write down this in comments. So whenever in chat and uh, whenever we pause uh, for discussion, you can also share it then. So, yeah, please. Okay, so yeah. today, um, we're going to do the same kind of, um, of a session. I have a presentation that I'm going to be talking about, and I invite you to participate. It's, you know, for your own benefit to share with each other's experiences, questions, thoughts, either by writing it on chat, like Margareta said, or by voicing your thoughts. And um, we're going to have a short break, and, you know, then we continue to other subjects. And um, the subject that today I'd like to talk about is building and developing a relationship with our patient or client. I think everybody understands that that is the basis of our work. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's a process and it takes mindfulness. And, um, and perhaps later on, you'd like to share about your experiences of building relationships with, with patients or clients, because it's obviously very different than building relationships in many ways, it's different. In some ways, it's the same with, you know, people in general. But when we have a live-in client, I think um, we have to be minded of different things. So let's see what we want to talk about today, building and developing the relationship with our patient. Okay, the first step is creating good communication. Coordination of expectations, obvious. Building trust, very important. Creating the caregiving alliance and taking into account social and cultural components. So we'll talk about each one of these steps more in detail. So creating good communication. Well, um, I wanna mention that there are different types of ways that people communicate, no matter you know, what language they speak, it's a personality issue. And so we're gonna mention those. Um, so firstly, uh, every person has a, has a unique communication style, a way in which they interact and exchange information with others. There are four basic communication styles that we're gonna talk about. The passive, the aggressive, the passive aggressive, and the assertive. It's important to understand each communication style and why individuals use them. For example, the assertive communication style has been found to be the most effective because it incorporates the best aspects of all other styles. When we break down these four styles, we'll better understand the characteristics of each style, standard phrases, and what makes them unique. So we'll begin by talking about the passive style of communication. Passive communicators often display a lack of eye contact poor body posture, and an inability to say no. Passive communicators also act in a way that say, people never consider my feelings. Passive communicators are also easy to get along with as they follow others and go with the flow. But, and this is a very big but, we must be minded that if this is the kind of behavior that we as um, caregivers adopt, then obviously um, being able to say no and look someone in the eye is not a very, uh, not being able to say no and not being able to look someone in the eye is not a very um, straightforward and honest way to communicate because we don't put ourselves into the situation, right? We take ourselves out of the, out of the situation. And so, um, we don't, we're not uh, expressing what we feel, what we think, and um, easily we could be taken advantage of, okay, and misunderstood. And um, perhaps in some cultures, it may be considered polite or respectful, um, you know, not to look a person in the eye and to go with the flow and not to oppose, you know, someone in any way, especially a, a boss or someone from his family. 
but it, that is not necessarily the best way to behave, okay, as a caregiver. And if your client behaves in this way, also, it makes it very difficult to understand what it is his thinking, what it is his feeling, and um, his attitude towards things, because he's just not really there. So very important to understand that if this is the way that you encounter people behaving, you must encourage them, perhaps, to change, okay, if it's possible. Aggression, okay, the aggressive communication style is emphasized by speaking in a loud, demanding voice, maintaining intense eye contact, and dominating or controlling others by blaming, intimidating, criticizing, threatening, or attacking them, <clears throat> among other traits. Well, obviously, this is not a very um, comfortable or positive way to communicate, not for us as caregivers, obviously, and definitely not pleasant to have a boss or a client or a patient who behaves in this way. But knowing that this is their way of communicating, it's important to try to understand why and how to alleviate this type of stressful situation, okay? Because we are caregivers, it is our responsibility, not necessarily to accept it, but to try to find out what's behind it and perhaps to alleviate stress that leads to it. And then uh, we talked about passive aggressive. Here we go, passive aggressive, okay? Passive aggressive communication style users appear passive on the surface, but within he or she may feel powerless, stuck, and build up a resentment that leads to seething or acting out in subtle, indirect, and secret ways. Most passive aggressive communicators will mutter to themselves rather than confront a person or an issue. They have difficulty acknowledging their anger, use facial expressions that don't correlate with how they feel, and even deny that there is a problem. Okay, so passive aggressive people are usually under is um, imbalance between um, what they feel and what they need to say, or um, if uh, you know they think that it may not come across um, in the same way that they intended to, and so on. So this is a situation that causes a lot of stress because there is a you know, it's all about misunderstanding. It's all about misunderstanding. You're not putting yourself out there clearly. You're not um, voicing what you feel if you're the caregiver or if you're the client. So this is not a very positive way of uh, communicating because you're misleading, okay? The person you're trying to communicate with. And the one that we'd like to, um, to stress and recommend is being assertive. Assertive communicators can express their own needs, desires, ideas, and feelings while also considering the needs of others. One of the keys to assertive communication is using the I statement, such as, I feel frustrated when you are late for a meeting, or I don't like having to explain this over and over again. It indicates ownership of feelings and behaviors without blaming the other person. This isn't an easy way to communicate and it takes training and mindfulness to do so. But I think it's very important that you adapt as much as, you know, you're very important when you're surroundings, especially you being able to pick on, we'll talk about that a little later, but <clears throat> the rest so uh, recommended or whatever, but put so to summarize, passive communication, emotion, self-denying, blaming, and apologetic. Passive aggressive communication, entails emotionally dishonest, indirect, self-denying at first and self-enhancing at the expense of others. And the aggressive, the aggressive behavior is usually <clears throat> characterized by inappropriately being honest, direct, expressive, attacking, blaming, controlling, self-enhancing at the expense of others. And the one that we would try to achieve and to encourage our clients to behave in such a in manner of communication is to appropriately be honest, be direct, self-enhancing, expressive, self-confident, empathetic to the emotions of all involved. Okay, I think the main word is also to be confident. 
And at first you're not going to be confident because obviously you're new and everything is different. And so I think even when you are new and everything is different, presenting yourself in a direct, honest, and, um, and uh, how should I say it, positive manner um, is, is going to eventually lead to your uh, self-confidence building up. So this is very important, okay, to be, and I also want to say that in terms of culture, in Israel, people usually are very direct in the way that they approach you, okay? Um, people call you by their first name, they expect you to be to call them by their first name in sort of a in personal, you know, a personal kind of a way, in one sense. On the other hand, they may tell you directly, you're not doing this properly without looking for a polite, necessarily, you know, gentle way. They might just go ahead and tell you, you know, this is not the right way, or you know, it's too late, it's too early, it's too hot, it's too cold, you know, all of those things. They may say very directly, but it's not necessarily uh, an attack or, um, you know, or being controlling or anything. It's just part of our culture. So you're going to have to give yourself some time, uh, try to be assertive, and also learn the situation that you're in. Okay. So tools for effective communication, understanding how others communicate can be a key to getting your message across to them. In order to develop effective communication style, here are a few tips to keep in mind. Take ownership, as I said before, bring yourself forward, say what you mean, okay? The I statement. Maintain eye contact, very important, if you feel comfortable with it, but make yourself feel comfortable with it. Voice your needs and desires confidently, and don't forget to smile, okay? It makes things easier and smiles are in all languages, okay? So how to deal with aggressive behavior and language? That is usually the most difficult part, okay? Some of your clients may have uh, health issues. Some of them may have emotional issues, psychological issues, or a combination of all of these. And perhaps, you know, uh, all of these may lead to aggressive behavior and language towards you. So firstly, here is a YouTube uh, uh, presentation that you are welcome to look at that may have some uh, tips about how to, um, how to respond, how to behave uh, towards that kind of a behavior. Because if you are uh, in some situation encountering this, then you, as the caregiver, have to be the one that knows how to deal with it, obviously. But I also want to say that there is no reason to, on a continual basis, be in a situation where you are abused in any way, physically or any other way, okay? So if you come across a situation where you feel that, you know, you don't how, know how to manage a person, you know, your client or someone in his family who is being abusive, and it's not just part of their, um, you know, part of their, uh, how should I say it, for the, for the, you know, for the moment kind of an outburst part of their uh, situation, but it's a continuation of a relationship, then you must consult others, okay? You must consult others, either the agency or the call center, um, you know, the placement agency will have a social worker, uh, perhaps people in the family. Uh, very often, uh, this kind of negative behavior from a client can be adjusted with a different type of medication or, you know, whatever. So it's, you don't need to be alone in this kind of a situation. And you should consult and see if this could be alleviated. Because if someone is behaving in this way, it's not just, you know, um, the person that's taking care of him who is suffering, but it's an expression of tension and uh, not feeling good, right? Feeling anxious and tense and angry or whatever. And these are not good feelings. So we want our clients and patients and their family to be calm and collected and as, you know, as happy as could possibly be. So this is, you know, this is the goal, okay? Of good care, this is the goal 
to know how to manage if you encounter those situations. Okay, so we know that you know verbal communication is just one part of the you know of communicating, and perhaps some of your clients and families um, don't know English so well or perhaps speak other languages. Israel is a country of immigrants, people, you know, not everyone, but very often many people have come from other countries, other cultures, they've been immigrants and they've been you in a situation in a place like yourself. And um, if, if they are good English speakers, perhaps you're not. So there's all different ways of communication, right? We all know that. And I always like to think that, you know, all our pets and household animals, they don't speak Philippines and they don't speak English, obviously, but they understand us. They understand the tone of our voice. They understand the rhythm. They understand if we're loud or if we're soft, if we're gentle, if we're, you know, trying to be, <clears throat> trying to be kind or angry. All of those things come out without really understanding the words. And so we must be mindful of the nonverbal communication not only through our voice, but also, also through our bodies, our gestures, and so on. Along with the four communication styles, there is also nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is any way in which people can transfer information between them without the use of words from the spoken, written, or sign language. Nonverbal communication is expressed and facial expressions, body language, okay? Clasp hands indicate closure, for example, tone of voice, physical gestures, standing and touching, okay? So we all know that it's very possible to communicate without language, you know, verbal language altogether. And, you know, we use many, many tools. That's part of our toolbox as being professional caregivers to try to use all kinds of tools in trying to uh, communicate well with our client, influencing their mood, influencing their well being, and so on. Um, I'd like to think that smell and touch and, um, you know, um, and all of those other um, ways that we um, experience a situation will uh, also be part of your toolbox, okay? So um, if someone is agitated and you wanna change their mood, don't hesitate to find out what kind of music they like, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of atmosphere they enjoy and feel calm in. Sometimes it's just soap and water. Sometimes it's, you know, hand cream. Sometimes it's a gentle touch of the neck or, you know, sometimes it may be, um, you know, many, many other things. Um, smelling something baking in the oven. We all know how all of those things influence our mood. And I highly recommend that you find out as much as possible about your client and his family and what makes them feel comfortable and relaxed and joyful. And all of those things will be part of your toolbox in, you know, in being a professional. And of course, if you do have a language that you can use in order to communicate, then we have obviously active listening. I want you to understand that Listening is not just something you do in a passive way, but listening is something we do in a very active way, okay? So we try to encourage a person to talk and we look them in the eye and we give them our full attention. Find out what your patient or client's opinions and thoughts are, emotions, and not to make assumptions about what they think or feel and never make judgments, okay? This is them and we don't judge them even if we don't agree. And reflection, in order to make sure you understand what your patient meant, try to reflect. I understood what you are saying. I, and I don't understand. Can you repeat that so I, I can understand? And often when we have a conversation, we, if we repeat the words that you know, the person is talking to us is saying, then that gives them a feeling of affirmation that he has been heard and understood. And of course, empathy. 
try to empathize with your patient, even if you don't agree, okay? Uh, in the beginning, obviously, if you don't know him, it's difficult to empathize with him. But again, we want to know, we want to not put them through a um, interrogation, but gently find out about their life, what were their occupations, what were their triumphs, what were their disappointments, who are the people that are important in their life, what were their losses, how do they feel about, you know, this time in life and so on, having a real personal conversation and of course, sharing your own as much as you feel comfortable in sharing, okay, but that's part of having an interaction. And of course, again, I emphasize the I message when you present yourself as well with your background, your story and so on. When you talk about your opinions and thoughts, use the I word, okay? Very important. So tools for effective communication. Obviously, patience. Be very patient with your patient and his family. And I stress the family because Sometimes there is no family that's involved, but very often there is. And they have been there and they're, you know, perhaps some families divide the, um, the tasks that are involved in caring for a, you know, a disabled person. Perhaps one is in charge of medicine and, you know, that, and the other person's in charge of financials. And, and maybe not, maybe one person is in charge of everything. But you must know that you're part of a team. And I absolutely encourage you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Corona and how that's influenced and changed people's lives. I think you can be aware of that. But, you know, um, families use perhaps WhatsApp or Viber and they have a group and they, you know, take the initiative, take the initiative to transfer information. You're going to have a routine, right, of a day where what you do in the morning, afternoon, evening, once a week, once every two weeks, you do this, you do that, make sure you take inventory, you have all the medicines that you need, you have all of the, you know, cleaning things, food things, all of those things you must check to see that you have in time so that you don't run out, no drama, no, you know, uh, looking for something, and so on. And of course, you'll have to know about his medications and who, you know, who his doctors are and how you're involved or not involved, you know, what issues and so on. So be very um, patient with yourself and with the family, okay? Because you have to invest in them as well. They're going to be helping you. And because you come from a different culture, different country, very often people think, oh, how did she not know that? How does she not understand that? So, you know, be patient with yourself, ask again and again, even if they don't tell you ahead of time, don't hesitate. The situation is new to them and it takes time to get to know each other. Okay, it's new to you, it's new to them. Tolerance, even if you don't agree with your patient, try to respect his opinion. It's okay to disagree and to make conversation about it, but try to be tolerant, okay? Very important that you understand that, you know, when you're coming into a family, perhaps they, you know, they've been waiting and they, they're tired and they're anxious and everybody has, you know, expectations. We'll talk about that a little later, but even so, um, this is a new situation. You're not a daughter, you're not a neighbor, you're not a caregiver that comes and goes, you're a caregiver that's going to stay there. And, um, and it's very important to be tolerant of their way of life, okay? How often they bathe, what they eat, when they sleep, when they don't sleep, all of those will be your minute life, okay, experience, and very important yourself. And of course, non to a patient, maintain eye, relax, and smile. I also want to emphasize about um, eye level aspects. One aspect is, you know, feeling that you're more able, and so you're the boss in the situation, and what, you know, we don't want to do that. Our client is the boss. This is his home. We want to assist him to be as independent and make as many decisions as possible. We're there to be a third hand, a third leg, you know, so to speak. And of course, we don't want to talk below him. You know, he's not going to abuse us. He's not going to misbehave and so on without our professional response. And then there's the real eye level, okay? Um, most of our patients and clients are going to be sitting or laying down most of the time. So when you're having any kind of communication with them, be at eye level, okay? 
not standing up when they're sitting down and you're trying to communicate, not, you know, not sitting on a, a low bench when they're up on, a top, on the top of you. You want to try to be at eye level as possible, speak to them in a clear, gentle, and I would say short messages, short messages to make sure that you understand each other. And your communication style. What can you do if a patient has a communication style that's difficult to handle? That's a very big question. And which concerns do you have about your own patient's communication style? Or anything else you'd like to, you know, voice or comment or share with us? You're very welcome to do so. Anyone like to share an experience about communication and a work situation? You're all quiet today. <laughs> yeah, somebody is, is about to share with us something. I think uh, it would be interesting, maybe interesting to start maybe you guys with you, with those of you who, uh, who uh, had an experience of working in another country because it's also, you know, uh, the communication style can be affected by that as well. As you remember, Sarah mentioned during her presentation that in Israel, for example, people are very direct, very straight uh, to the point, very forward uh, to, towards uh, their needs or thoughts, etc. So, uh, you know, some in some places uh, it can be uh, perceived as aggressive way of communication. But here in Israel, it's called assertive. And uh, it's, a, it's a major value here <laughs> to, com to communicate this way. So what about you? What, what did you experience in other countries? I think Hydra Lee opened up her mic. Uh, yes. do, you want to, do you want to say something, Hydra? Please do. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. Uh, for me, mom is my communication style is sign language because of my son. I have a deaf mute son. Go so ahead. sign language. So you know sign language. Yes, ma'am. So I learned that in the Philippines. Oh, okay. Yes. And and um and not just sign language, but I'm sure that you're very sensitive to communication without verbal language makes yes, you very much attuned to all of those other things that we spoke about, tone and body language and gestures and and you know all the other ways that we try to communicate with each other sometimes we're aware of them and sometimes you know most people are not i'm assuming yes. that you are more aware well thank you for sharing that so you already have an extra added skill yes mom. And i'm sure that's going to come in handy when you're okay have you worked abroad before I no no mom okay. uh my experience is my son only okay because my son is deaf mute so didn't uh, didn't hear and didn't okay. talk. Okay. I'll just ask how old is your son? He's 18 years old. He's grade nine right now. Okay. So he's almost an adult. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yes, mom. Thank you. Anyone else want to share something with us? Ask a question. Okay, we're going to have a five minute break, everyone. And um, you're welcome to write if you have things that you want to share or ask about it. I think we spoke about communication style, um, Hebrew, culture, holidays, whatever. And uh, we'll come back in five minutes. Okay, Margareta? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll Thank see you, guys, everybody, in five minutes. Thank you. So please, five we'll minutes break. Be here to start from the same point in the five minutes. Yeah. Communication. Please do.
Hi, Roy. Morning, Mom. Hello, good morning. Hi, hi. hi. Go ahead. Yes, Mom. For me, my communication style is assertive. For me, good communication to my employer is very important. I try my very best not to argue with him. I am very careful to my words in order that, in order not to offend him. We are caregiver. Our duty is to take care of our employer, to make them comfortable and happy and safe. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. So um, from what you're saying, I understand that you've encountered this kind of a situation where you disagreed with your employer on many issues and um, you were careful in your words and not to, uh, yeah, not to offend if you disagree. That's, you know, that's it. That makes us professionals. You're absolutely right. Sometimes, you know, with friends and family, we can feel comfortable arguing, voicing our opinion, you know, yeah. but when we are at work, no matter where our work is, right, we don't want to jeopardize our situation and cause conflict. So yes, best not to uh, argue and um, yeah, be tolerant of, uh, of, our, of our patient, our client's opinion, if they don't agree with us. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else like to share a situation or an opinion about what's involved in communication? with others, please do. Okay, uh, good morning. Say your name, say uh, your name, good morning. I'm Rizalina. Rizalina, nice Yes, name. first name. Okay. okay. In regards for the, what is your communication style, as you say, ma'am, you here in Israel practice assertive, right? But uh, we as Philippines, we are good in sugar coating in terms of delivering our sperm. Best, we best way in terms of difficult, we will try to meet in the middle. Being passive if they are aggressive, be assertive if they are not on the right way. And uh, being exposed, being with experience uh, and being abroad with a past uh, uh, work experience uh, and being exposed to different cultures and languages, we can confuse on how they uh, express, express their feelings. Some of them express their feelings through a uh, flat face, but high pitched tones. Some of them express their happiness, just smile, but in not delivering good words. So. For us also as newcomers in this country, I encourage I encourage all my caregiver and co-workers to let's uh, try to not comprehend or just try to uh, limit our practice in the Philippines and try to adopt easily in this country. Uh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Rizalina, that's a very, uh, very important advice, you know, from your experience, I understand that different cultures express things differently, and also different people, right? I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, um, it's an individual kind of a trait to get a smile out of someone that's uh, not a smiler <laughs> can be difficult, but when he does give you a smile, you know, he's not very happy. And, uh, and just the opposite, right? So sometimes people are very critical and, you know, I'll just say about myself that um, my children always say, um, mom, we wanna buy something, but we want you to come and to look and find all the defects. I said, what? I said, <laughs> they say, yeah, you always see the defects. I said, wow. I think of myself as a positive person, but, but you know, like I said, so um, sometimes we don't see each other uh, ourselves the way, <laughs> the way others see us and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, sometimes people are very critical and they'll voice that and we don't wanna take it personally. And we do wanna be professional in trying to learn the cues that um, you know that it are the communication cues between our client and ourself, right? Just like I don't want to say that you know that you know, but um, but yes, it is a, a two-way kind of a situation, and we should be minded to different cultures and different family situations. Okay, where did you work, Lisa Lina? Uh, you share with us from I work in a hotel, mom, in Macau. In Macau, okay. Yes, hotel. And what? And what do they, what language do they speak there? Uh, they speak almost three languages, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Macanese. Uh, 
But most of uh, the visitors in there are foreigners. That's why we more express ourselves into English and just more uh, small training in their language because they are multilingual. Okay. But they are more express. Yes, they more express in terms of action, nonverbal communication. Because most of them are not good in English as well. Okay. Yeah, working in a hotel, people are demanding and they want to have a good time. Um, unlike, <laughs> unlike yes, they are really our they are. clients, <laughs> they want to have a little bit of an easier time and probably just as demanding. Probably just yes. as demanding. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to comment? Someone no, just one second. I, I would just like to add something. What's going on? Um, yeah, guys, maybe those of you who sit close to each other in the same room with open Zoom microphone, that's what does this noise. So if you want to say something, share with us with your microphone open, you need to go, you know, far as possible in your uh, uh, quarantine facility in order to avoid this noise because we, we won't be able to hear you anyway. Just one last comment uh, towards uh, what Rosalina just shared, and thank you for that. You also mentioned uh, the challenge or com um, complexity yeah, or difference, when, not just in communication, but with expressing your feelings and emotions. And I just wanted to uh, comment on that, that uh, there is a whole topic tomorrow that Sarah will uh, talk with all, the, all of you guys uh, about this, because, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not only just about, you know, gen general communication and uh, things, how, uh, you know, about cer a certain way of doing things, but also about how we feel and, you know, what we feel and what your client feels. So, yeah, I just, just wanted also to make some uh, emphasis on that. and to mention that you have something to look forward to tomorrow. We're going to talk about feelings and communications more tomorrow. But um, OK, anyone else like to share an experience on working or living in a different country or a different uh, culture, learning a different language? Or okay. different communication styles. Okay. Um, I'll just continue. Just want to check, Michelle, you wanted to say something before and the, the noise came from your microphone. It was by mistake, but you still want to share with us something. Okay, we'll continue. Yeah, well, maybe later, if you feel like you want to do it. Okay, so here are, um, again, is a YouTube um, address that you can check into and watch a uh, presentation on tips for communicating with the elderly um, at your own time, hopefully it would be helpful. Okay, step number two and coordination of expectations, okay? When starting a new job, any job at all, starting a new relationship, each side has expectation, hopes and concerns. Try to have an open conversation with your patient and his family about their needs and expectations. It's important that you also express your needs and expectation and try to be honest and open and willing to learn. I think this is self-explanatory. We all go into a relationship, any kind of relationship with expectations. Sometimes we're not even really aware of our own expectations, especially the client. Uh, maybe they are, they're sad and they have an expectation that you will make everything happy. If they're lonely, now they're not gonna be lonely anymore. Maybe, you know, uh, whatever. Some pe sometimes people have realistic and sometimes unrealistic expectations. Sometimes they're aware of them and very often they're not. So um, it is important to try to talk about as many things as possible in terms of expectations. <clears throat> 
And along the way, there may be changes in the patients or your expectations and needs, and it's okay as long as you speak about it, okay? If you maintain good communication, you can always talk again openly about your patient's expectations and your expectations and re-coordinate expectations, okay? So obviously, your patient or client has brought you into their life at a time when they are weak and um, and perhaps mourning the loss of their abilities, of their loved ones, whatever situation you're entering your life in a bad time, not at the happiest moment of their being. And so it's very important that we take risks R and to understand your own needs and to voice them, okay? Obviously, it's important that you have a safe and comfortable space that's your own, you know, a bed, a closet, where to put your food, where you prepare your food, and all of those things are very important, basic, you know, when to take a shower, how much hot water to use, when you can speak to your family, when is your minutes and time off, when you can exercise, pray, meditate, listen to your own music, you know, a few minutes or whatever time that you need to recharge your batteries. And everyone needs to recharge batteries, okay? No one can be on 24 hours a day, six days a week. So um, take the time to rest, take care of yourself, okay? But also you must voice your needs so that it is a two-way street. I want to emphasize, we don't want to be insulted if at first, you know, we are treated with a, um, you know, um, how should I say it? Uh, having a stranger in the house makes someone feel uncomfortable, agitated, you know, till you have a relationship, not to be offended, and it takes time. And again, keyword is trust. Okay, so what is involved in building trust? Reliability. Sincerity, integrity, consistency, commitment, competence, okay? All of those things make up trust. And we all expect that from ourselves. And mostly we expect it from our, you know, our patient and his family as well. It's a two-way kind of a communication, okay? So what is trust? Trust is one's willingness to be vulnerable to another based on the confidence that the other has goodwill and is trust, trustworthy, component, honest, and openness. It is a shared belief that you can trust someone to achieve a common goal. Okay, common goal here is to take care of a person. They're entrusting their body, their, you know, hand office. Okay, you're coming into, you're a stranger. From, it takes time to build that, but it will okay. trust based on respect, you say, okay? This straightforward forward, you say, yes, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, I didn't know, or I won't do it again. It was unintentional, you know, that builds trust in a person. Share your situation as well, you know, maybe you're, you're sad. I don't know, you're missing your family. This is a new kind of a situation. Um, be open with yourself that, you know, allows your client to commute to, to be, um, how should we say, you show your vulnerability and he feels more comfortable exposing his vulnerability to you, obviously. And of course, reliability, yes, very important. They have to rely on you for all the important things in their life. So it's very important that, that you are reliable. And consistency, consistency is very important. I hope that you all understand how that's important. People like their routine. It makes them feel safe and confident, okay? So you have to find out what their routine is or build a routine that's, you know, comfortable for them. If they're slow, if they're, you know, adjust to their pace. They like their routine, what they do first, then what they do second, what they do third. Even if it's not the best way to do things, do it their way. And slowly, if they trust you, they'll allow you to change, okay? Whatever it is that needs to change, if something needs to change, okay? Um, and of course, commitment. Commitment is something that they have to know that you're committed. I mean, it's not like you can't lead if you like but you are committed to make the best of things. And so if something is not exactly how you want, you want to share with them and say, I'm here and this is what I need. And I want to be here and I want to do my best to make it good for you. And obviously for it's good for your client, it's going to be okay for you as well. So more ingredients in trust, willingness to be vulnerable, right? You have to also be real, your person, show about yourself, what's hard for you, what's good for you when you're happy, when you're not so happy and so on. I don't mean that you need to burden them with all your troubles and anxieties, but you know, just a little bit to be personable. A sense of security that trust recipient will meet expectations, okay? Goodwill 
the belief that the recipient of the trust will protect the well-being of the trust giver, right? They have to trust you that you have their best interests at heart, okay? That you will in no way jeopardize anything that is in their situation, okay? Their health, their property, whatever. Reliability, a connection between predictability and goodwill, honesty. I think that's very obvious. We don't trust people that are not honest, so we want to present ourselves and be honest, okay? Fit between statement and action. What you say is what you do, what you do, exactly. Openness and transparency. Like I said, you made a mistake, something didn't go right, you know, didn't work out. We're all people. You have to be open about it, that it like all cultures and all you want to be treated with respect. Patient. Open his most private space for you, his home. And like you, he has concerns, expectations. Trust yourself, trust your patient and trust the process of getting to know each other. If you trust the others, they will trust you, okay? Always tell the truth, and if something bothers you, don't keep it inside. Try to talk about it, okay? If not with your client, with someone in his family, if not with someone in his family, perhaps someone in the agency, the call center, you're not alone. You want to make a best effort to make the situation work. We don't want to, you know, perseverance is very important to learn how to deal with difficult situations is what makes us professionals, okay? So creating the caregiving alliance, okay? What's involved? The caregiving alliance consists of three essential components. Agreeing on the caregiving tasks, okay? That's part of making expectations meet, right? We meet our expert, tell you what you need to do. Take care of this, take care of that, take care of the other, make a schedule when you do things in the morning, when you do things in the beginning of the month and so on, agreeing on the goals of the care, okay? So the goals of the care would be to whatever the family and the, fa and the person wants you to do, accompany them, drive them, uh, you know, just be at home with them, uh, whatever. Developing a personal relationship consisting of mutual positive feelings, trust, and good communication. And I think that is, yeah, that's caregiving alliance. The caregiver caregiving alliance is usually determined at the beginning of the relationship between the caregiver and the patient and for the relationship between them. Such a contract gives stability to the caregiving relationship and a sense of mutual responsibility and partnership, okay? So again, you must ask as many questions and don't hesitate. And even if you feel that you're being answered, you know, impatiently and so on, again, smile and ask your questions, write things down, especially kitchen, um, you know, kashrut laws and so on. If you have light, not turning on light, shut family. And, um, but not everyone observes everything. So there is no right way or wrong. And um, ask all of those questions, television, or can you go in your room and turn on your laptop? Um, do you sit in the garden when he sits in the garden? Do you... Uh, you know, how often can you take a shower? What, what are you expected to do in terms of cleaning or cooking or whatever? All of those questions you must ask and you may not know them ahead of time, but it's always good to, you know, readjust and find out what the expectations are. And sometimes you may agree and sometimes not, but it is a situation of, right, of communication and negotiation. Taking into account social and cultural components, okay? Part of the caregiving alliance is to take into consideration social and cultural components. You have different language, lifestyle, customs, preferences, and beliefs. It's okay for you ex to express <clears throat> your preference and to keep your customs, but it's better to talk about it with the patient and reach an agreement. Try to take into account the culture, the values, the customs, the traditions of your patients. This includes food preferences, daily routine, and habits, okay? So again, you want to be in the beginning, I would, you know, say a fly on the wall, <laughs> not to make yourself in a real presence. You are present, obviously, but to watch and observe, okay? And to make yourself fit in as much as possible. And slowly, you know, your, your presence is going to be more and more obvious you've never lived in a Jewish family. And again, I stress that, um, especially now that Corona is at hand, 
people are very suspicious of, of you know, of diff diff a lot of suspicion and this, um, especially our unfamiliar cause discomfort. So you want to, at the beginning, cause as little discomfort and be as, you know, as inconspicuous as possible. And then of course, slowly everything falls into place. Okay, slowly things fall into place. And then talk about ship between client and, and patient and uh, how important it is and perhaps experiences that you've had, trust has been broken or whatever. What do you think is the most complex step in building a trust relationship? What do you think is the easiest step and how would you, and do you have any concerns about it? Anyone want to share, comment? No comments? Today we're on the uh, agenda of quiet morning. <clears throat> Rizalina, you want to say something? You know, I'm just encouraging the other to talk also. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just share some thoughts. Maybe the some of my co kababayan will also have the courage to share their that's as well we learn from each other so you know yeah just to break the silence just to break the silence of what do you think is the most complex steps as you mom said we are foreigner in here we're a stranger the most complex steps maybe is the building of trust uh because of, of uh, most of us has a thick wall in terms of protecting themselves most especially from the stranger or a new member of the house which is uh, you don't know what they came from, what their experience, what their attitudes, cultures, and practices. So there, are, uh, you mentioned the base of the trust, which is quite a lot, and it takes us a time to establish ourselves and to gain trust uh, from the family member and as well as our uh, patient. But maybe or uh, establishing ourselves well and be trying to help us to more fasten this process of establishing uh, trust or the building trust between us, a newcomer, and the family that we will work on. Thank you. I'll just say that, you know, very often when we are in a new situation where, like you say, we want to um, establish trust, sometimes we test people. And so you are going to be tested. <laughs> I don't know in which, in which ways. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so anyone want to share about a situation <laughs> where they were tested, you know, to see if they're trustworthy, if they're honest, if they're, you know, whatever, competent. But I think it's only natural that, you know, we test people in a new situation to know how we want to continue our relationship with them. Has anyone had that kind of an experience? They were tested? Mm -hmm. For us, in correlation for my background, I work as a, back, way back in the Philippines, I work also as a nurse, where we always been in test uh, in terms of the, in terms of competence. Because uh, all we, us, we know our family, we, uh, we value our family member and we didn't entrust them in terms of uh, taking care of them or uh, giving the full 100% trust uh, for any people to cure them or to mend them. So establishing yourself, uh, just show them their competence so that they will see your capability that you can do uh, what the best for their family members as well. Okay. Um, I just got a 
thing on my computer that my internet is not stable. So if I get disconnected, Margaret, I'll be aware. I may need to connect again. Um, yeah, and they may test you in other ways, you know, in many in many different ways. I don't know, maybe hide money and uh, see if you find it, what you do with it, or I don't know, something else. Um, anyone want to <laughs> talk about that being on a test basis in the beginning? You know, we're all on a test basis in the beginning of any job, right? <laughs> I just want to add maybe something to what just Rosalina said. Turn your mic on, Margareta. Okay. So, sorry, it's a Murphy law. Whenever I just started to speak, just at the very second, I received a phone call. I just wanted to say that um, what uh, just Rosalina said is also correlates with the uh, Building trust uh, step that uh, Sarah uh, talked broadly and presented broadly during this session, and I wanted to say that you know it's uh, ongoing. Uh, it's not maybe a pleasant feeling yet to be under test, uh, but you know it's something that, as Sarah mentioned, it's something that we we have to all be aware and know. And even you know, even if we will face the nicest person in the world and. You know, subcon subconsciously, unintentionally, it still will be there. Yes, yeah? so we the same way you test. You know, the same way you test yourself, test your new employer. So, um, I just wanted to say, uh, try uh, something that Tara also mentioned before. Try to not try to not take it personally. Yeah, because it's not. Uh, it's, they're not testing you as you because you're Zelina, because you're Jessica, because because you're just a new person. And a new position, and they want to see, you know, that uh, they can trust you, and they can uh, rely on you because it's very vulnerable to be uh, dependent to the extent that they all uh, depend uh, uh, depend on you, on your assistance, um, on your words, on your moods, on your approach. So yeah, you know, it's something that we cannot avoid. Yeah, it's not something that you know. It would be easier if it can be skipped now some way to be to be tested and not to have this trust from the beginning but it's a, it's a also it's, it's a very important part of work and uh, i assume all of you who you know choose this uh, uh, very very important job uh, aware and we are just here to remind it to you and to talk to you about it and to think about it uh, with you together and to reflect or share, you know, thoughts and emotions about that, more or less. I would like to add one more thing in terms of trust. I think one of the things that um, I haven't mentioned yet is confidentiality, okay? So the thing that promotes uh, trust in all of us is um, confidentiality, okay? We share, we're sharing with our patient or client the most intimate part of his life, all of his weaknesses, obviously his physical and uh, disabilities, and that's very demeaning sometimes. And, um, and also uh, we want to know them. And so hopefully he will share with us, um, you know, other parts of his psychological and emotional uh, weaknesses as well, or situation. And we, they have to know that, that, that we, um, we share their confidence, okay? We don't divulge any of their personal private issues with anyone, okay? It's a non-spoken, um, uh, how should I say it, a commitment, yes? That uh, whatever is, um, is divulged to you through this interaction stays between you. And all, you know, and that also helps to build confidence in, a, in, your, you know, in your client and, um, and it's very important. So. You know, if you're writing a blog, if you're writing a journal, all of those things are recommended for you to, you know, to have a way of uh, expressing your feelings and your frustrations, desires, anxieties, we're people as well. And so we have to have a way to let out our, our feelings. 
but I said, okay, and your family, only if they approve to your own family, internet, sometimes we forget, you know, how vulnerable the media is and how it, you know, we can, um, we can make mistakes. So please be very minded that uh, confidentiality of the family's issues, whatever issues they are, um, yeah, you want to be part of that, you know, and to know about it, so you know how to behave and deal with it, but they also have to trust you, okay, with whatever um, people have secrets, issues, uh, you know, whatever, conflicts, all of that's part of everybody's life, no family is without, and so confidentiality is very important that um, they must trust you with that, not just your patient, but everyone else that's involved, okay, so um, you have to be creative in your job to learn how to kind of manage everyone in, in the correct way, and uh, yeah, it is being a, man a project manager in many ways. Okay. Okay. Anyone like to comment about that? Okay. Can always improve. And you have to smile a lot. Smile a lot. And what I'd like to teach you now is a gesture that you'll find very often people use. So what we do is we do this. We hold our fingers together like this. We wave our hand up and down, sometimes one hand, sometimes two hands. And we say rega rega. Rega rega means a moment, a moment. A rega is a moment. So be patient, please wait with a smile. Goes a long way. Rega rega, okay? <laughs> We're very physical, passionate people here in Israel. We have loud, noisy attitudes, and we voice them. And uh, don't be offended. Don't take it personally. You don't have to adapt it as your own means of communication. But, uh, you know, <laughs> just learn it. Like um, Rizalina said, different country, different culture. You got to learn the cues. And maybe even uh, just a small addition to your last sentence, and I think we didn't, uh, we mentioned, but we didn't emphasize it enough uh, during our last session on uh, Friday, that even in one religion, one culture, the different rules and, you know, in each single home. So we shared with you a few links uh, on the Viber group about the shrews and about Shabbat, uh, just to give you a general idea, but it's not that we said or want you to think, you know, that that's what uh, you all should expect in each uh, uh, single home or each uh, single, you know, Jewish religious home. Yeah, because uh, things can vary and they can, uh, yeah, and the best, just the best possible way uh, related to this topic and just all that we're discussing now is just to communicate, to ask, to not expect uh, from yourself to know and to guess. It's better for you and better for your communication. It's better for the trust that we discussed here. Just to be, you know, open, open book and a new, new uh, blank uh, sheet just to write down all things, you know. But in, in your approach, I'm metaphorical to ask, uh, you know, things that um, related to to these things or to other things. So if you feel uh, going back towards our um, uh, previous. Uh, uh, discussion about being tested also to be you know like oh yeah what do you expect from me to do just to just to ask to be honest and to be open not to take it also personal and then hopefully also will show the other side your approach your openness and your willingness to, to learn about each single thing so anyone else like to ask a question or comment before we part for the day. Okay, so I will um, say rega rega. Wanna everybody do this? Rega rega. Yeah, good. <laughs> Don't be shy. Rega rega. Rega rega rega. Rega rega. Exactly. Very good. Okay, rega, everyone. Rega. Good, good, good. <laughs> Guys, and... just before just before we say goodbye, I just also wanted to uh, tell you what you should expect from us, you know, to see in the group and when you uh, next time will see us uh, online. 
So uh, we will share with you, as I said in the beginning, the recordings of uh, last two online sessions. We'll also share with you some additional recordings. And um, we are aware that we share with you a lot of information. Uh, and uh, you know the advantage of the recordings that you know that you can just go back and to listen uh, it's all over again on this very specific part uh, both now during the quarantine but also whenever you leave the facility you start to work and you feel you know you want you have a question about this or that or you don't remember some specifics on this topic you cannot it would be available for you so you can go and do that um so, yeah, as I said, so today we'll share with you a few more recordings, not only from the online sessions, but additional topics. And tomorrow we will meet with you in the morning online once again. And as, as already mentioned, Sarah will present for you another uh, uh, part uh, of a uh, caregiver uh, relationship with your clients, uh, you know, from another angle, but we'll also, uh, the second part of this online meeting, you'll have opportunity to meet uh, um, a caregiver from Filipinos, your fellow, who came not under bilateral agreements, but just like you to work in the caregiver, home-based caregiver sector. And she is a, she worked, she's in Israel already about two years, and she will be gladly share with you her experience, her story, and uh, answer your questions. So, uh, and now it's uh, difficult to, you know, have a courage to sh share, but it's your opportunity to find out the answers to things that you know are interested for you from someone else's experience, and you know have it. Uh, you have the, we'll, you will have this opportunity tomorrow. So maybe already start to think what things would you like to be uh, shared with you during tomorrow's session as well. Sarah, would you like to add something, please? No. Nympha will join us tomorrow. That's the caregiver's name. And um, um, she tells her story and you're invited to ask any issues or you know, questions that you may have. Um, and she'll gladly answer it. Um, I met Nympha through the Zoom business myself <laughs> a few weeks ago. And um, yeah, and she's very good at sharing. She's very open. And so I encourage you to, you know, be open and ask questions if you can. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day and a good week. We say here in Hebrew, Shavua Tov. Have a good week. So have a, a good week ahead of you. Shavua Tov. And thank you. We'll see you soon. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mom. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.